How's it going, everyone? Uh, welcome to this next chapter, uh, chapter 26. We're going to be talking about fluid, electrolyte, and acid base balance. And I'm going to break chapter 26 down into a couple of different videos, just so that the video itself is not too long. Um, but let's get into the first section here. And right off the bat, I'm going to talk about something that you might not have thought of as very scientific before. But I'm sure most of us have made Kool-Aid at some point in our lives. And if you need a refresher, uh, you get a pitcher of water, you pour a packet of Kool-Aid mix into it, you stir it up, and voila, you have a tasty beverage at your fingertips. Now, you might have to put some sugar in there, depending on what the mixture uh, you're putting in contains. Um, but we, so you're, you might be asking yourself, how is Kool-Aid very scientific? Well, Kool-Aid is what we call an aqueous solution. Um, and if you remember, a solution is a mixture that includes a solute, and a solvent. And if it's an aqueous solution, um, an aqueous solution is one in which water is the solvent. So a solute and a solvent. An easy way to remember the difference between solute and solvent is to say the solvent dissolves the solute. And if you need another way, I always say there's a V in solvent and there's a V in dissolve. So if you ever think about an aqueous solution and you're like, oh, is the water the solute or the solvent? Well, water is dissolving your Kool-Aid packet, right? So it is the solvent because it's dissolving. So hopefully that helps. Um, but we're, we're also not just talking about Kool-Aid here, but it helps us as a good place to start because the chemical reactions of life take place in aqueous solutions as well. In the human body, the solutes are going to vary depending on the different part of the body, but they might include proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and importantly, electrolytes. Um, what's an electrolyte? Well, when we talked about uh, salts, which are Na and Cl, uh, is just one particular salt, uh, sodium chloride. When those dissociate in an aqueous solution, they become charged ions. If they're positive, they're cations. If they're negative, they are anions. And often in medicine, a mineral that's dissociated from a salt that carries that electrical charge is called an electrolyte. So for instance, sodium ions that are Na plus are cations, and chloride ions that are Cl minus, anions, are often referred to as electrolytes. But even further, uh, bringing it into something that we're familiar with, in the, in the body, water moves through cell membranes, which if you remember, are semi-permeable membranes, and from one compartment of the body to another by a process called osmosis. Just to remind you, osmosis is the diffusion of water from regions of higher concentration to regions of lower concentration along an osmotic gradient across a semi-permeable membrane. As a result of that, water will move into and out of cells and tissues depending on the relative concentrations of the water and solutes found there. An appropriate balance of solutes inside and outside of cells has to be maintained to ensure normal function. And so you can see that in an isotonic solution where the concentrations of solute are the same inside and outside of the cell and water for that matter, um, so water will move in and out at the same rate and the red blood cell here will uh, be normal. If we get into our, a situation where a cell is placed in a hypotonic solution where there's more solute in the cell than there is out of the cell, the water, therefore, will rush into that cell and you'll get a swollen red blood cell, which will eventually burst like a balloon. And then uh, the opposite version of that, if we get our red blood cells into a uh, solution that is hypertonic, where there me that means there's more solute on the outside, the water will rush out of the cell and you'll get a shrunken, shriveled red blood cell. And so it's very important for our bodies to keep our cells in isotonic solutions or basically solutions that are normal for the environment. So you probably all heard the saying that we are mostly water and that's really not untrue. The human body is mostly water, ranging from about 75% of body mass in infants to about 50 to 60% in adult men and women. And then when you proceed in age, it'll get as low as maybe 45%, but that's still nearly half. 
Um, your brain and kidneys are going to have the highest proportions of water. You can see here the brain is about 80 to 85 percent, your heart 75 to 80, lungs 75 to 80, your kidneys 80 to 85. But the lowest um, in your body is going to be the teeth, which have the lowest proportion of water at only 8 to 10 percent. So just something to keep in mind that we are um, very, very dependent on water uh, in general. Um, the next thing I want to talk about are fluid compartments. Um, body fluids can be discussed in terms of their specific fluid compartment. Basically, a location that is largely separate from another compartment by some form of physical barrier. There is the intracellular fluid, the ICF compartment. It's the system that includes all fluid that's enclosed in cells by their plasma membranes. And then we have the extracellular fluid, which has two parts, but the extracellular fluid surrounds all the cells in the body. The two primary parts or constituents of the extracellular fluid are the fluid uh, component of the blood, which we know is called plasma, and something called the interstitial fluid. It's the fluid that surrounds all the cells that are not in the blood. So those are the extracellular fluid. It's Pretty, it's pretty simple if you think about it. Intracellular is all the water that's in cells, and all the water that's not in cells and it's outside of the cell is the extracellular fluid. First, let's talk about intracellular fluid. The intracellular fluid lies within cells, and it's the principal component of the cytosol and cytoplasm. The intracellular fluid makes up about 60% of the total water in the human body. So it's uh, six out of ten, right? It's a lot, uh, a good amount. And in an average sized adult male, that, that might account for about 25 liters, which is seven gallons, of fluid. This tends to be very stable because, like I just said, the amount of water in living cells is closely regulated in order for those cells to survive. And so this, um, this an amount of water is basically always going to be the same. And like, like we just saw on the pr previous two slides, if the amount of water inside a cell falls to a value that's too low, the cytosol will become too concentrated and it'll cease to be uh, carrying on its normal activities. And at the same time, if there's too much water, the cell might, be bur might burst and be destroyed. The extracellular fluid accounts for the other one-third of the body's water content. Approximately 20% of that is found in the plasma, which is the liquid portion of your blood. And... Um, the other, uh, t basically 10% or, or so, of that would be your interstitial fluid. Uh, the fluid, once again, that is, is basically surrounding cells that are not in the bloodstream. Um, the body also has other water-based extracellular fluid. Those include the cerebrospinal fluid that bathes your brain and the spinal cord, the lymph, which we just talked about, the synovial fluid, which we talked about when we talked about synovial joints, the pleural fluid in your pleural cavities, the pericardial fluid in the cardiac sac, the, uh, the periotoneal fluid in the periotoneal cavity, and, uh, and the uh, aqueous humor of your eye. Because these fluids are outside of cells, they're also considered components of the extracellular fluid. Um, here's just a, a pie chart, basically giving you just that information that I talked about um, in, in a chart form. You can see about 60% of it is intracellular fluid, another one-third interstitial uh, fluid and plasma, which, uh, and then the, the other fluid that we talked about, uh, the synovia fluid, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, making up the extracellular fluid, the extra 40% that we were talking about here. So um, that's just something uh, to look at as a graphic. But when we talk about composition of these fluids, the compositions of the two components of the extracellular fluid, which again are the plasma and the interstitial fluid, are more similar to each other than either of them are going to be to the intracellular fluid. Um, when we look at something like blood plasma, it's going to have high concentrations of sodium, chloride, bicarbonate, protein, and the, in, uh, the interstitial fluid will have high concentrations of sodium, chloride, bicarbonate, but maybe relatively lower concentrations of protein. You can see that here, um, with blue being the interstitial fluid. But you can see in all the other areas, red and blue are very, very similar to each other. Um, in contrast, the intracellular fluid has elevated amounts of potassium right over here, whereas the other don't, uh, phosphate right over here in this molecule, magnesium, and protein. 
And overall, it contains high concentrations of the potassium and phosphate, whereas both plasma and the ECF contain high concentrations of sodium and chloride, those electrolytes. And so it's just different differences in the compos composition that might be um, important to know uh, just to, if, if I gave you a question on the exam and said, uh, here is random uh, vial of fluid from the body, it contains high amounts of protein, is it likely from the intercellular, interstitial, or plasma? Well, you would tell me it's likely from the intercellular, right? So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, let's talk about fluid movement between compartments. Um, let's see. So basically, let's, let's just talk about hydrostatic pressure again. Remember, it's the force exerted by a fluid against a wall. And what it's going to do is cause movement of fluid between compartments. The hydrostatic pressure of blood is the pressure exerted by blood against the walls of the blood vessels by the pumping action of the heart. And so basically, depending on where the net filtration pressure is positive or at zero or negative, depends on what happens to the blood. So basically, uh, down at the arterial end here of the blood vessel, you get a positive net filtration. And what happens is that fluid will exit the capillary since the hydrostatic pressure is greater than the blood uh, colloidal osmotic pressure. And so what you'll get is filtration out of the uh, blood vessel. In the middle, you get in the mid capillary, you'll get no net filtration pressure. And so no net movement of fluid since the capillary hydrostatic pressure is 25 millimeters of mercury and blood colloidal osmotic pressure is 25. And so it will just keep moving along. And then you have a complete opposite of what you had at the arterial. At the venous end, you get reabsorption because pressure is now negative in the blood vessel and so fluid will re-enter the capillary since the hydrostatic pressure is 18 and that's going to be less than the osmotic pressure which is 25. And so basically as you have heard me say multiple times by now fluid will always move and anything that acts like a fluid including oxygen right uh, will move to wherever the pressure is lower. So with that I'm going to end that video here we'll pick up next time in the next video and talk about water balance.